Olá, bom dia, sejam bem-vindos ao canal de YouTube da Biblioteca Brasiliana Bindig, da Universidade de São Paulo. Hoje estamos aqui com o um evento, com o um evento, um momentinho, por favor, desculpa, eu estava com um eco aqui. É, estamos aqui no evento Bicentenário de Maria Graham no Brasil. Maria Graham é uma, uma viajante inglesa que chegou originalmente no Brasil pela primeira vez em 22 de setembro de 1821, mas no dia 9 de dezembro do mesmo ano é a data que ela saía da Bahia de Todos os Santos é, para o rumo do, ao Rio de Janeiro, que foi o lugar onde ela viveu durante mais tempo. E para celebrar os 200 anos da, da Maria Graham no Brasil, é, nós temos aqui a, os professores Carl Thompson e Jennifer Hayward. É, vou introduzir esses do, os nossos convidados. O Carl Thompson tem doutorado pela Universidade de Oxford e a sua pesquisa desse período resultou em seu, em seu primeiro livro, The Suffering Traveler and the Romantic Imagination. Desde então, ele publicou extensivamente em diversas áreas. Em 2011, lançou o volume Travel Writing pela Routledge. Em 2016, editou The Routledge Companion to Travel Writing. Nos últimos anos, Thompson tem se dedicado aos estudos sobre viajantes mulheres do século XVIII e XIX. Ele acaba de publicar uma edição crítica de Letters from Tenerife, Brazil, The Cape of Good Hope and the East Indies, da Jemima Kindersley, New Journal of a Residence in India, da Maria Graham, pela Chotten House Library, Taylor and Francis. Além disso, Carl Thompson vai lançar uma monografia sobre Maria Graham pela Oxford University Press. Thompson também se interessa pela cultura marítima dos séculos 18 e 19, particularmente pela representação literária de naufrágios. Suas principais publicações sobre esse tema foram editadas em duas coleções. A primeira, intitulada Romantic Europe, Shipwreck Narratives and Anthology, com a Trent Editions, de 2007. E a segunda, Shipwreck, Shipwreck in Art and Literature, Images and Interpretations from Antiquity to the Present Day, publicada pela Routledge em 2013. E Jennifer Hayward é professora na Faculdade de Worcester, ela possui doutorado pela Universidade de Princeton e é professora de Mídia Global e Estudos Digitais na Faculdade de Worcester. Seus livros incluem Consuming Pleasures, Active Audiences and Serial Fictions, que foi lançado pela University Press of Kentucky em 2009, e as novas edições de Journal of a Residence in Chile e Journal of a Voyage to Brazil, de Maria Graham. No seu período de pesquisa como bolsista Fulbright no, no Chile entre 2016 e 2017, inaugurou sua mais recente colaboração com Michel, Michel Prain, Bryce, com quem Hayward coordena o projeto Chile Anglófono, um arquivo digital de jornais publicados pela colônia britânica do Chile, no Chile no século XIX. Sejam muito bem-vindos. E aqui o... o o Rodrigo também está mostrando, a gente, a Maria Graham, que é a viajante sobre a qual a gente vai falar hoje, ela é uma das viajantes que está no projeto Atlas dos Viajantes no Brasil, da Biblioteca Brasiliana Mídia. Então, se vocês quiserem saber um pouquinho da trajetória da Graham, depois, é, eu, a, a gente recomenda muito esse site, que está muito bacana, com vários viajantes que estiveram por aqui. Obrigada. A... E agora eu vou passar para o inglês, as palestras vão ser em inglês, infelizmente a gente não tem tradução simultânea. So, uh, Carl and Jennifer, welcome, and thank you so much for accepting our invitation, for being here. We're so glad to have you, and also to hear more about this fascinating traveler who um, inspired so many works and who um, has just, well, becoming, has been becoming more and more, let's say, well-known here in Brazil, although her time here was actually, uh, she was here for, for quite a few years, right? Mm -hmm. So thank you so much, Carl. Uh, the floor is yours. You may start your presentation. Thank you. 
obrigado, Julia. Uh, hola. Um, I would say tudo bem, which is about the, the only Portuguese I really know, I'm afraid. So tudo bem to everyone. Okay, let me begin by just trying to set up my um, slides. So wait a second. Yeah. How is that? Can everybody see my slides okay? Are they visible? Yes. Yeah. Great, thank you. Okay, well, I'll begin then. Um, just over 200 years ago, uh, more precisely on September the 21st, 1821, the British naval vessel HMS Doris anchored in the seas off Olinda in Pernambuco. Three days later, on the 24th, one of the Doris's passengers, the British travel writer Maria Graham, made her first venture onto Brazilian soil. She was undaunted by the fact that Olinda was at this point caught up in the Brazilian War of Independence and surrounded by hostile revolutionary forces seeking to end colonial rule in Brazil. Indeed, Graham would later recall that this circumstance was precisely one of the reasons why she wanted to get ashore, since she had, quote, never seen a town in a state of siege. And so began in a characteristically uh, intrepid fashion what would become for Graham a fairly extended en encounter with Brazilian society and culture, an encounter which ultimately um, comprised three separate visits to the country. The first ran from September 1821 to March 1822, uh, when the Doris voyaged up and down the coast of Brazil, enabling Graham to make numerous trips ashore of various lengths uh, to places like Salvador in Bahia, Rio de Janeiro, and elsewhere. The second visit uh, then ran from March 1820, um, oh, I've got the dates right there, yeah. No, sorry, that should be March 1823, sorry, there's a typo, uh, to October 1823, sorry, there's a mistake on my slide. Uh, when, when Graham returned to Brazil after an intervening period spent in Chile. And for this stay, she was principally resident, uh, resident in Rio. During this time, she met the new ruler of the now independent uh, Brazil, Dom Pedro I, and became especially friendly with his wife, Empress Maria Leopoldina. This led to Graham being offered the role of tutor to one of the royal princesses, an offer she accepted and which she returned to take up in September 1824 after making a short trip back to Britain to purchase teaching materials, and perhaps most importantly, to oversee publication of two travel narratives about her time in South America. And these were in the third and fourth title in that list there, the Journal of a Voyage to Brazil and the Journal of a Residence in Chile. And it's for these two publications, of course, that Graham's chiefly celebrated today in South America. Uh, they remain important, incredibly rich documentary accounts of Brazilian and Chilean life at this crucial transitional juncture, as both nations threw off, threw off colonial rule and achieved independence. Graham's third visit to Brazil, Brazil would not be an especially happy one. She was soon ousted from her tutoring role at court uh, and then spent the remainder of her year in Brazil, chiefly gathering plants and other natural historical materials. However, in my own talk, this is pretty much all I am going to say about Graham's time in Brazil. Jennifer is going to return to this theme uh, in due course. But for my part, I want to address Graham's life and achievements before she came to Brazil. Understanding Graham's early CV, as it were, her curriculum vitae, uh, helps us to understand why she was so eager to visit Brazil and Chile and what she hoped to learn and what she hoped to do in literary and intellectual terms in both uh, Brazil and Chile. Registering Graham's earlier life and achievements also help, helps us avoid what is still quite a common misapprehension uh, when it comes to Graham's two South American journals. I quite, fre quite frequently come across online discussions of Graham, for example, which essentially pigeonhole her somewhat dismissively as a naval wife accompanying her husband on a tour of duty who just happened to keep a very detailed, very conscientious diary. That's to say, often she's regarded as a sort of real life counterpart to the more or less contemporary character Mrs Croft in Jane Austen's Persuasion, I'm sure some of you will know. Um, it's true that Graham's voyage to Brazil came about because she was accompanying her naval captain husband Thomas Graham on a tour of duty. It's also true that Graham, like Mrs Croft, has got a forthright, no-nonsense persona. But there really uh, the comparisons with Austen's character you know, sort of reach their limit. As I hope now to demonstrate, Maria Graham was a much more accomplished figure in intellectual and literary terms than Mrs Croft, 
And we need to know this background to her South American travels if we're properly to appreciate her achievement uh, in texts like Journey to a, of a Voyage to Brazil. So let me begin by outlining Graham's early life and the beginnings of her literary career. Uh, the future Maria Graham was born the rather plainer sounding Mary Dundas in 1785. Her father was a naval officer and the family was of Scottish extraction, though Maria's earliest years were spent in the northwest of England and then she attended boarding school in Oxfordshire. Perhaps the key formative event in her intellectual development came in 1803, when at the age of 18 she moved with her father to Edinburgh. Women, of course, couldn't attend universities in this period, but in Edinburgh, Graham managed to have a sort of vicarious university education by socialising extensively with numerous professors and thinkers associated with what we now call the Scottish Enlightenment. The philosopher Dugold Stewart was a friend, for example, as was the geologist John Playfair. Her private journals from this period reveal an intensely studious, self-disciplined young woman, fluent in several languages, keen to keep abreast of scholarship across a variety of fields, including history, geography, ethnography, and the natural sciences. Such was her appetite for scholarly debate, indeed, that Graham apparently earned in Edinburgh the nickname Metaphysics in Muslin. Graham's career as a traveller began in 1808, when her father was posted to Bombay and the 23-year-old Maria, along with her sister and brother, also made the long voyage to India. Throughout the voyage, which took in visits to Madeira and to Cape Town in South Africa, Graham busied herself with scholarly reading, learning Persian and maintaining a detailed journal. And I think it's fairly clear that from the outset she was intending to write up the journey to produce a publication, travel writing being a hugely popular, uh, a hugely popular genre in this period, and I'll say a bit more about this in a second. Uh, Maria also found time during the voyage out to acquire a husband. She fell in love with one of the ship's lieutenants, Thomas Graham. Uh, character characteristically, their love seems to have blossomed as they read together Dugold Stewart's Philosophy of the Human Mind. Uh, and the couple were married uh, when they reached India in 1809. In India, Maria lived uh, initially in Bombay, residing with the prominent Whig intellectual Sir James Mackintosh. But her 20-month stay also took in visits to Pune, Sri Lanka, Ceylon as it was then, the Malabar coast, Calcutta and Madras. Throughout, Graham took a keen interest in all aspects of both the various local cultures she visited and also the expatriate colonial community. But her particular fascination was with Hindu... Oops, what's that? Next? Sorry. Was with... Bear with me. Why is that? What, sorry, her particular fascination was with Hindu and Buddhist antiquities, such as those at Elephanta and Kali, which she visited and sketched. And these are her own illustrations of these two um, sites of Indian antiquity. And this is part of a considerable openness and receptivity to the Indian cultures she encountered. Graham, of course, is, is very much not devoid of some of the prejudices of her day. For example, she often rails against what she perceives as the squalor and passivity of modern day for her modern day Hindu culture, contemporary Hindu culture. Uh, and she finds that squalor hard to square with Hindu accomplishments in former periods. But in her respect for India's past glories and in her readiness to acknowledge many Indian achievements in the present, such as their finesse as botanical illustrators, Graham stands very much in the respectful scholarly tradition of contemporary figures like the Orientalist William Jones, rather than the more racist evangelical tradition starting to emerge in this period which regarded Hindu culture simply as a, a superstitious abomination. Graham has no time for missionaries with such a crude outlook, and she also makes some acerbic Jane Austen-like comments about the provincial, provincialism and stolidity of the expat British community in India. This becomes a frequent complaint during her travels. She's often distressed to enc encounter compatriots whose interests don't extend beyond making a profit, in the case of the men, or acquiring husbands and gossiping, in the case of the women. Graham's appetite is always for what she frequently terms rational companionship, rational curiosity. That's to say, she's perennially interested in questions of history, natural history, art, culture and politics. And she's interested as well in the scholarly comparative analysis of different cultural and religious traditions. 
these intellectual interests are very much to the fore in the travel narrative Graham then published shortly after her return to England, a journal of a residence uh, in India. And again, these are some of her own illustrations from that volume. Uh, Graham was only the second woman to publish a book length travel account of India uh, after Jemima Kindersley, who had published account in 1777. Uh, and this is something that represents more of an achievement than you might realize. We're accustomed today to think of travel writing as a rather minor, slightly sort of lightweight genre. On the one hand, it's not as artistically ambitious as a novel, say. Yet on the other hand, it's not really the genre we go to for hard, factual information about another culture. So the modern travelogue has become a sort of rather in-between marginal genre, often slotting into the category of easy reading. Think of something like Elizabeth Gilbert's Eat, Pray, Love, for example. But travel writing in Graham's era was a very different beast indeed. In the age of explorers like James Cook, Mungo Park, Alexander von Humboldt, in the age also of agricultural and political reformers in Britain like Arthur Young, William Cobbett, all of whom produced travel accounts. In this period, travel writing was still regarded as an important knowledge genre, as one recent scholar has put it. Obviously, there were different types of travel writing, ranging from serious weighty accounts of major exploratory expeditions, on the one hand, to, on the other hand, more frivolous or inconsequential personal reminiscences. Obviously, different writers uh, foregrounded different themes, different preoccupations. But most readers in this period, recent scholarship has really uh, emphasised, expected travel writing to offer something useful and intellectually substantive. The idea was to give an account that could appeal simultaneously to scholars, scientists and the intellectual, intellectually curious, to investors and merchants consider, considering business projects overseas, to those interested in foreign policy and world affairs, and also simply to those who just wanted a taste of the exotic or the picturesque. Yet at the same time, and partly because it had this very mixed wide audience, travel writing in Maria Graham's day was also meant to wear its learning lightly and to offer its information in an accessible, even elegant way. So this was a template then Graham was writing to, uh, and to my mind, a template she fulfills, set of expectations she fulfills admirably in her first travel account, Journal of a Residence in India. The result is a, a rather more dense, information-heavy type of travel writing than perhaps we're used to today, as Graham takes an omnivorous um, interest in many aspects of Indian life. Simultaneously, she incorporates into her narrative mini essays on topics such as Parsi beliefs, Hindu mythology, Mughal political history, from which it's apparent she was well read in the latest scholarship on all these issues. And she also wove in reflections and observations on the natural history of the region she visits. Yet throughout, she also has an eye for the piquant or amusing detail. What it's like to ride an elephant, for example. By no means unpleasant, was her verdict. Uh, or she also points out the fact that roast porcupine is apparently delicious. Quote, the best animal food I ever tasted. Graham can also uh, modulate into accomplished picturesque scene setting to convey the grandeur of landscapes. And of course, she illustrates her, her picturesque sort of verbal descriptions with these wonderful illustrations of her own. She was a very accomplished draftswoman. And occasionally, Graham writes in a more philosophical, self-reflective vein, pondering the interplay of memory, imagination and sensory perception as we travel and the effects differing locales can have on our sensibilities and sympathies. But I should stress that Graham's gaze is for the most part resolutely directed outwards rather than inwards. She's in many ways much more of an enlightenment than a romantic traveller. However we categorise Graham's travel writing today, however, what is clear is that Journal of Her Residence in India agreed very much with contemporary taste in 1812. The book received some dismissive reviews. The Quarterly Magazine, for example, patronisingly labelled it a literary curiosity we are not disposed to overlook and suggested Graham had travelled to India principally to acquire a husband. But overall, the reception was favourable, and the volume ran to a second edition in which Graham refuted strenuously the allegation of husband hunting, stressing a little disingenuously that she'd met her husband before she'd actually got to India. Uh, and more importantly, the volume's success gave Graham an entree into London literary and intellectual circles, and she was soon attending dinner parties, which included the likes of the political philosopher William Godwin, the famously cosmopolitan Madame de Staal, 
She soon struck up in this period a, a close friendship, lifelong friendship with the eminent publisher John Murray, publisher of course of figures like Byron and of many exploration narratives, and Murray would be a lifelong friend as well. Then for much of the 1810s, the Grahams were resident in Scotland, where Maria kept up her literary and scholarly interests and followed closely contemporary politics and public affairs. More sadly, the couple seemed to have tried unsuccessfully in this period to have had ch to have children, uh, and that never happened for them, and Graham never became a mother. The absence of parental responsibilities, however, presumably played some part in Graham's freedom to travel, and in 1818, she embarked with her husband Thomas on a voyage to Italy, which took in en route Gibraltar, the coast of Africa, Malta, and Syracuse in Sicily, all of which were sketched by Graham. This was the prelude to a year-long stay in Italy, mostly spent at Rome, where Graham found a highly talented expatriate community, much more to her taste than the expat community in India. Here she became friends with the artists Charles Eastlake and Thomas Lawrence, through whom she met figures like the painter Turner, and Turner judged Graham um, a very agreeable blue stocking. She, uh, blue stocking was a contemporary term for a sort of intellectual woman uh, in this period. Uh, Graham also associated extensively with Italian artists, writers and intellectuals like the sculptor Canova. The summer of 1819 was spent in the small town of Poli in the Apennines to escape the heat of Rome. This gave rise to Graham's second travel narrative, Three Months Past in the Mountains East of Rome, published shortly after her return to England. Here, even more than the India volume, we see Graham offering what is really uh, a sort of a proto-ethnographic fairly encyclopedic account of a small agricultural community well off the beaten path of the standard grand tour. Again, there is plenty of scholarly reference and comparison. As with the India volume, however, the learning is lightly worn and enlivened with entertaining or intriguing stories. The latter part of the narrative especially charts the activities and the Graham's frequent near encounters with a bandit gang that moves into the area. That's the illustration I've given you there from uh, illustrations here are not by Graham herself, but by Charles Eastlake. And the volume as a whole was again well received in Britain, with Graham being praised for finding an interesting new perspective, an unfamiliar location uh, for, for a travel writer, which was no easy feat in a destination as well covered as Italy. This is one of the reviews. So by 1820, Graham had laid the basis of a whole of a career as a travel writer. And she would go on to ultimately write four published, produce four, four published travel accounts. And it's worth stressing this was unprecedented uh, for a woman author in this period. Women had published travel accounts before, but overwhelmingly they published just one account, in a couple of cases, two accounts. Graham's the first person to publish four accounts, and I would argue the first person really to build a whole career, public persona, as a travel writer across a career. And for the reasons I was outlining it earlier, because of the sort of greater intellectual weight given to travel writing in the period, this was really quite a pioneering step for a woman writer to do. Um, a couple of last things I will just say before I pass on to you. Also, this Italian trip in 1819, it lays the foundations for another strand of Graham's sort of intellectual and literary career. And this is her work as a, in the fields of art history and art connoisseurship. connoisseurship. Coming back from Italy, she produces uh, a memoir of the painter Poussin, and this is the first biographical account of Poussin in English. And she goes on to build on this across her career with a number of other art historical publications, perhaps the most substantial of which are her essays on the history of painting. She comes out in two volumes in the 1830s. Uh, and she also becomes, as we're saying, in the 1830s, really the central organizing figure of quite a, a small but quite influential, sorry, a small but quite influential art salon, where she helps to promote a new emerging taste in, in the Italian primitives, those painters before Raphael and the sort of high point of the Italian Renaissance. And in this way, she's part of the shift in taste that leads eventually to artists like the Pre-Raphaelites later in the century. And one final strand to Graham's intellectual sort of portfolio that's worth mentioning is also she is uh, a very enthusiastic, accomplished, and um, what we perhaps might now label amateur scientist. Um, throughout her travels, she collects extensively minerals, rocks, plants, seeds, uh, insects as well. Um, and because she's not just interested sort of as a sort of amateur in these uh, activities, because this is a period when, if you like, there is little division between expert scientists and an array of more sort of amateur enthusiasts, 
Graham is very familiar with many of the major theoretical debates in the fields she engaged with, because she's actually personally friends with a lot of leading scientific figures like John Playfair, who I, who I mentioned earlier. And as a consequence, Graham is also able to make a, an array of sort of modest but not insignificant scientific uh, contributions across her career. Um, she gathers plants, for example, during her trip to South America. Some of those, one of those specimens remains the lectotype by which that particular species of plants is still recognized. Um, she also brings back seeds uh, and various sort of specimens to give to friends and, and nurseries in Britain. Returning for her third trip to Brazil, she undertakes for the leading botanist uh, William Hooker to supply him with plant samples and with drawings. And what you can see here are some of the drawings she did for Hooker, uh, which are now archived in Kew Gardens in London. Um, and she also perhaps the most significant scientific contribution to arrive from her South American travels uh, is the fact that she becomes the woman to produce the first, to, to offer the first article, have the first article published in the transactions of the Geological Society when she describes um, an earthquake that she happened to witness during her time in Chile. So there's, there's no sort of lack of small but not insignificant scientific contributions that Graham makes. So as you see, this is not just a sort of a, a cap naval captain's wife arriving in Brazil. This is a woman who has established a, a considerable career and public profile as a writer and as an intellectual. Uh, one magazine in 1821 had labelled her one of 24 living women of genius working in Britain. Um, and so she arrives in Brazil with these credentials. And it's very clear she, she arrives in Brazil with the intention that these are circumstances. This is a journey that should produce more travel writing because of the exciting political things that are happening in Brazil. And with that, I will stop and I will hand you over to Jennifer, uh, who will pick up the story of uh, Maria Graham actually in Brazil. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Carl. That's fascinating. I can't wait for your biography. So to start off with, I'll just say I had Thank not. You, Jennifer, I think. Oh. Yes, wonderful. Um, to start off with, I'll just say that I had not heard anything about Maria Graham until I went to Chile in the 90s. And Chileans hearing that I was working on 19th century British literature kept saying to me, then, of course, you know Maria Graham. And because I'd never heard of her, I immediately read her in Spanish originally. And the Chileans are still very, very interested in her journal because in the 1820s, when she published it, the Chileans were much too busy worrying about independence to make a meticulous daily record of what life was like, what people ate, how they decorated their homes and what the characters and the appearance of the major independence figures were, and Graham recorded all of that. So she, historically, she's very, very important, and in Brazil as well. Um, so I'll build on what Carl has already presented, and the first few slides of this talk will move through very quickly. So all of the images in this presentation, I should say, come directly from Graham's journal. She, as Carl said, was a fantastic artist and worked really hard to record the visual perspective on Brazil as well as her intellectual and cultural perspective. Next, please, Julia. Thank you. So again, we'll move very quickly through this because Carl's already done a wonderful job of setting up her biography and her central works. In this talk, I will move primarily through the major themes of her Brazil journal and some of her preoccupations, which I find especially fascinating. And then at the end, if we have time, I'll talk very briefly about the moment that Carl's already mentioned when she returns in 1824 to take up this position as the governess of uh, Princess Maria de Gloria, which I find it really fascinating her interactions in the palace, the fact that she was expelled from the palace within such a few short weeks. And I think based on what she wrote in her unpublished Life of Dom Pedro, quite deservedly. I think the only thing that I would add to what Carl said is, although I think she was a genius, an amazing writer, she was also a terrible snob. And like anybody at that time, she was 
quite insular in her perspective, right? So she had a very strong British Empire perspective. To her credit, and I'll talk a little bit more about this later, I think she was also able to move past that perspective, but it really shaped everything she saw when she journeyed out of her own familiar territory. Next, please. And again, we can move very quickly past this slide because Carl's already set up her three journeys to Brazil. And what I'll be talking about today is that I think the Brazil Journal has a plot that I'll call a conversion narrative. One thing I think is fascinating about Graham is that Although, as Carl said, travel writing is often regarded as simply a record of facts. In fact, there's so much more literary crafting to that. So in my perspective, her Chile journal follows really pretty strongly the plot of a Gothic narrative in which she arrives, she lands in Chile, her husband has just died, and she has this position of the Gothic heroine who's isolated and abandoned and has to find her own way in the world. And she manages to do that. She introduces a Gothic hero in the person of Lord Cochrane, who fought, of course, for who was the Admiral of the Navy for Chile and then for Brazil during the fight for independence. So that's a really interesting plot. The Journal of the Voyage to Brazil, I see as a conversion narrative because during part one, covering her first introduction, not only to Brazil, but to South America also, takes this very kind of critical perspective and a, a perspective that's really drenched in Scottish Enlightenment philosophy, which Carl also spoke about. So she sees the new world as a place of sublime natural wonders and cultural degeneration. And if that sounds like a contradiction, it's because it is a contradiction. So the first part is really rife with contradictions in how she's representing in Brazil. By the time she returns in 1823, she has spent almost a year in Chile, and she's really shifted her perspective by traveling alone around the country, really escaping the bounds of the British Navy, and speaking to Chileans, becoming close friends with several Chilean families. And she's got a whole new ability to kind of escape this imperial perspective. So in that section, she takes what Mary Louise Pratt has called the position of an exploratrice sociale, someone who escapes her own culture and gets out into the countryside, into urban centers, and really tries to learn from Brazilians directly what their culture is about. So the second part of the journal is really fascinating in my view. Next slide, please. So just to start with a very brief overview, a little bit of what we call distant reading. So this is these next two slides are made using Voyant tools that I just took the text of the Brazil Journal and plugged it into this visualization and did a little bit of work with the tools just to make the perspectives emerge more clearly. But here, I think we can see some of the key patterns that were, were really fascinating, Graham. So this visualization is a word cloud of just the top 100 words used in the Brazil Journal. And so you can see, for example, this focus on Brazilian nature emerging with lots of use of descriptive terms like beautiful, sea, water, country, night, day, and so on. We also see, and this gets back to that enlightenment perspective on the new world that I mentioned earlier, lots of binary oppositions and contradictions. Great versus little, night versus day, city versus country, Portuguese versus English, white versus slave, and so on. So there's really this pattern of oppositions that's shaping Graham's perspective on Brazil, and we can see that in this word cloud. And then finally, we see a strong fascination with Brazilian culture and politics. As Carl mentioned, women's travel writing was governed by very strict conventions, and Brazil, or Graham, sorry, on one level, 
pretends to conform to those convention conventions, but underneath there's a really strong political thrust to this text. And I'll talk more about that later as well. But here we can see the recurrence of words like people, men, slaves, emperor, troops, country, English, Portuguese, Brazil, government, and so on. So all of these sorts of patterns that just show up in the word cloud. Next, please. Thank you. And so this is similarly, it's just data analytics looking at the trends in the words used in the journal. And the horizontal axis shows the journal divided into sections. So we can see how words are used more or less as the journal progresses. So one thing I think is really interesting is especially in the bottom image, you can see a real rise in particular words right around part two of the journal when Graham returns after her time in Chile. So you can see these, the top image is the most common descriptive ad adjectives, the six most common terms, great, little, beautiful, day, country, Brazil, and you can see how these ebb and fall across the space of the journal. And then in the second, the bottom image, you can see the nation focused terms in the Brazil journal, which I've pulled out and visualized here. So Brazil associated terms are the most common as we would expect. English associated terms are higher than Portuguese associated terms. So we see this preoccupation with her own national identity or the, rather the national identity that she is commonly associated with in people's minds and with the British Navy. We also see, I think it's really interesting that Scottish and British run neck and neck in the common commonality of her use of those terms. So we can see that Graham's own Scottish identity is actually really, really important to her, although she tends to pass as English when abroad because the Scots were marginalized within Great Britain at this time. And I argue that her Scottish identity is one thing that makes Graham uniquely able to step a little bit outside of the perspective of empire once she gets to know Brazil better. Next slide, please. So moving into the key themes of the journal, Next. One of these is abolition, and this was, of course, a hugely crucial and controversial concept when Graham was writing in the 1820s within Britain and globally as well. So most travelers, travel writers visiting Brazil would at least mention enslavement, but there's very few who focus on it with such, with the amount of detail that Graham does. And so that's really, really important. And I think comes right back to that Scottish Enlightenment perspective as well. So she gives really vivid perspectives on what it is like to see a slave market. She really tries to force us to experience that and experience the horror. In the slides to follow, I've tried to give a number of quotations from the journal just to introduce you all to the, the richness and the detail and the vivid nature of Graham's writing. So here is one. We had hardly gone 50 paces into Recife when we were absolutely sickened by the first sight of a slave market. It was the first time either the boys, those are the midshipmen on board ship, or I had been in a slave country. And however strong and poignant the feelings may be at home, when imagination pictures slavery, they are nothing compared to the staggering sight of a slave market. What is also really fascinating is that Common texts text generally would depict the dehumanization of enslaved peoples. What Graham does is actually depicts the dehumanization of the slave owners themselves. So in this quotation, she describes a white woman or rather fiend who is beating one of her enslaved peoples twisting her arms 
cruelly while the poor creature screamed in agony and so on. So really vivid descriptions of how horrifically she views the slave owners as well. And coming back to that Scottish Enlightenment training that Carl spoke of in that she received in Edinburgh, we can tell that that heritage through the quotations she chooses. So here she says that she herself, Maria Graham, made a resolution not loud but deep that nothing in our power should be considered too little or too great that can abolish or alleviate slavery. And that not loud but deep is a quotation from Shakespeare, but it comes to her through Thomas Carlyle, a fellow Scot, who quotes it in writing on the French Revolution. So she's got this political discourse running like a thread through her texts, but because she's a woman writer, the discourse is buried a little bit. We have to pull it out. We have to trace the lineage of her quotations. Next, please. So as Carl told us, Graham accompanied her husband, Thomas Graham, on the Doris. And the goal of this voyage was to protect British, especially mercantile interests along the coast. So the British had been trying to get into South America for decades as global trade routes rose, and they hadn't been allowed to because of Portuguese and mostly Spanish colonization. This was the first time that the British merchants were moving in in force. And although Britain was supposed to be neutral in the independence movements, they wanted to safeguard their own economic interests. So Graham knew she had to be neutral. And yet we see both in the published journal and in her letters to her good friend, the publisher, John Murray, that she was really strongly on the side of independence. And again, I would argue that we see partly her Scottish Enlightenment uh, heritage here. So here's just a few quotations from letters to John Murray. The cry of independence is becoming pretty general and independence sooner or later they will have. She admits that she wishes that she was not enjoined to be strictly neutral. I am sure any change, she says, must be for the better. And we also see that she, although she's strongly on the side of independence, although she does escape the British imperial perspective more than many travel writers, she's very much enmeshed in that perspective as well. So that, for example, she speaks with great pride about the awe that the British Navy must inspire in people around the world. Next. So just to very briefly, I mentioned earlier that she's a terrible snob and that especially in part one of the journal, she does have this very British perspective. So if you imagine Brazilians reading this account of their everyday lives, she's really blistering in terms of how she describes Brit Brazilian culture in the first part. So for example, she describes houses as disgustingly dirty. She repeats the word disgusting in talking about women's figures, which doesn't seem terribly proto-feminist of her. Um, she reveals the very different conventions of dress in saying that people are very thinly clad as in a tropical climate you might well wish to be, right? But it's very funny actually when you read travel narratives to see how the British dressed even in tropical climates, they preserve their sense of decorum and so on and dress very inappropriately for the climate. Part two, by contrast, the tone really shifts markedly. So for one thing, because Graham was really middle-class herself, she was thrilled to be introduced to elite people and she had more entree because she was British and so it's interesting to see the way that class can disappear when race and national identity come into play those sorts of intersectional shifts of identity 
So by part two, once she has a good friend, Dona Ana de Campos, who is Brazilian and gets introduced to Brazilian society, suddenly she's speaking of the sensible and well-bred Brazilians rather than the disgustingly dirty Brazilians. And all of a sudden also she sees the British as very kind of hidebound and insular and uninteresting. Of the English, she says, I see and wish to see very little. And it's also interesting that she starts to speak of Brazilian families as having beautifully close and intimate relationships, which she compares to the relations of clanship in Scotland. So here again, we see her own personal Scottish identity identifying with Brazilian culture as opposed to English culture. So these rifts in, in, in national identity come out. Next, please. So again, just to pull out some of these Scottish perspectives that are shaping her perspective on independence. She really starts to see Brazil as a possible global model for civilization in the rest of the world. I only wish, she says, that older countries would deign to take lessons from this new government with its noble liberality. She also, while she's speaking of politics, does try to follow the conventions that shaped women's travel writing. So those gendered constraints that tell her she should not speak about politics. She builds into her journal when she assures readers she will not pretend to speak of politics with any claim to authority. Since my opportunities of information were too few, my habits as a woman and a foreigner never led me into situations where I could acquire the necessary knowledge. So she continually downplays her own knowledge, and yet she ventures into politics almost continually as well. Moving to the final section of my talk, next. So, thank you. So speaking of the reception, as as Carl has told us the journal was published in 1824 and with her Chile journal, one of the few extant accounts of independence in Latin America. The journal both did the journals both did quite well uh, at the time in terms of their print runs and new editions, at least planned and so on. Next. Nevertheless, one of the early reviews was absolutely blistering. And so you can just skim through these quotations, but just to pull out some of their key themes. The reviewer whom we think, or though we're not positive, was William Jacob, refers to the journal as hasty and ill-arranged, contrasts it with a male writer, Southey's valuable history of that country, says that Graham boasts, but it would have been well to take care to be correct in her quotations. One can imagine Graham, who's so intellectual and erudite, reading this absolutely furious admonishing her that although the trouble of correcting the press is undoubtedly great, we would suggest that you take the time to do it and so on. So really a condescending and very rude review. Again, admonishing her that with her slight knowledge of the characters, her ignorance, her imperfect acquaintance, she's unqualified to write political disquisitions and recommending that she should have written a small volume of light material, such as women writers should engage in. This could have been a wonderful journal. Next slide. So Graham was furious, absolutely livid, and we can see this in her letters to her publisher, saying it's evidence the reviewer didn't even read me. Men never find out that we are entitled to think or speak our minds unless we're associated to some man. 
she says she was really, really livid. And I've paired her perspective on this review of her with an image from her journal of a woman independence fighter whom Graham met when she was there and found really fascinating. Next. So I also think it's really interesting that Graham is very careful to provide those obligatory disclaimers. Rhetorically, she's very, very careful in how she sets up her journal. Nevertheless, as we've just seen, she was harshly criticized. And we now, of course, think we've come so far in terms of acknowledging that women can write about politics, be just as intelligent as men, don't have to dance rhetorically around their perspectives, right? I actually think it's fascinating that we haven't come as far as we think we have. So this is where I will leave us today. Contemporary readers continue in the Chile Journal to obsess about Graham's imagined romance with Thomas Cochran, which I don't think for a range of reasons happened. But if you look, there's there's been a number of contemporary reappropriations of the Graham story, and even those by women writers generally focus on the romance with Thomas Cochran, not on her political perspectives, not on what she tells us about culture, not on what she tells us about global organization of systems of government and global trade, just on her supposed romance. So I will leave us with that today. And thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Jennifer and Carl, for these very insightful um, presentations. I, um, I have so many questions. And I really uh, like the fact that both of you talked about this contemporary uh, reception, which tends to place Graham in the same place, uh, in the same position as this uh, 1824 reviewer put her, um, just as a woman who has no idea what she's doing, um, and also as a ca the captain's wife, right? Um, which, is, um, uh, which is a very misleading uh, reading of Graham herself, right? And what is fascinating, um, and, and I'm, I, I love that, um, I read this, I was able to read this review because Jennifer, uh, she or in her edition with uh, Soledad Caballero, they, uh, yes, that one, exactly. They have, uh, they put this review and it is a fascinating review, especially because at some point, the reviewer said, uh, uh, claims that uh, she should have stuck. Uh, she should have stuck with the with the descriptions of the domestic spheres with the women, mm -hmm. and um, and perhaps uh, perhaps we could start from there, right? Um, as a, a, a very successful travel writer, and as uh, Carl said, one of, uh, probably the first one who had such success in this field. Um, what do you think changed? from uh, the first uh, travel uh, uh, travel narrative, the one about India, and the ones that she published later on? Oh, that's an interesting question. I mean, I do think, as Jennifer was suggesting, you can see her getting broad-minded. I mean, she, Jennifer's quite right. She never, you know, she, she she's always a creature of some contradictions, like we all are, and there is a sort of, um, she never entirely loses a sort of Anglo Scottish sort of implicitly imperial dimension to her thinking. But I think at the same time, she is also more, to a great extent, there's a lot of other writers I've looked at from the same period. She's, she is often more sympathetic to other cultures, able to think outside that box quite a lot. Uh, and that, to some extent, that's happening from, from, from the off, I think, with India. But I do think that um, ability expands over her travel times abroad. She, you know, she, she, she identifies much more with Brazil and Chile than she ever did with um, India, for example, partly because the cultures are quite different. But I think it's also she has grown up, she's got older, she's got more assertive. Uh, linked to that a little bit, I do think the the politics comes more to the fore. Um, I mean, I entirely agree with everything Jennifer's saying. 
but there's the, the, I would add to what Jennifer's saying. There's a sort of interesting double game in, in Graham, and apparently, and quite a lot of other women travel writers as well, which which Jennifer was alluding to, which is you know theoretically women are not supposed to talk about politics, but actually they always did talk about politics, and what they tended to do was put, as Jennifer said, this apology saying, well. I shouldn't really talk about politics, but here I'm going to talk about politics. <laughs> um, and I think what's interesting with Graham, uh, I remember I was being at an academic conference, we had a whole end-up discussion about this, is th these disclaimers, or what's sometimes called sort of modesty tropes, or, you know, I'm, I'm, I know nothing, what do I say? Um, with Graham, they are so emphatically sort of wrong-footed by the amount of detail she then gives, that you almost end up thinking, actually, they're sort of sarcastic. She's saying, what do I know about politics? Here's 20 pages on, <laughs> on such and such. And, and, and I do think um, um, one of the things about why it was so uh, badly received is, I mean, I think she's not, the pretense is barely there. That she, she, It's mm. a real nod to, oh, yeah, I'm a woman, I'm supposed to say I'm not interested in politics. But here are pages and pages and pages of political documents. Here are you know reproductions of Don Pedro's speeches. Here are ordinances from the Chilean and Brazilian governments. Um, so I think more, I think that that sort of in courage, really, I suppose, and, and, and ability to say, sort of, don't be silly, I am putting the politics out there, uh, becomes more emphatic as well in Graham. Uh, and then that is particularly shocking back in Britain because obviously this stuff has a it's not about the pol just the politics of Brazil. It's about the politics of Britain, which is in a very reactionary period. And Cochrane is an enormous sort of radical hero. So the fact she hero worships Cochrane, he has a complex political uh, presence and a very controversial one. And so, to, so the sort of politics, not only is she talking politics, the sort of politics she's talking is quite shocking for conservative sensibilities in Britain. So, 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 so I think that would be one thing. Her, her ability just to say, excuse my language, sod it, I am talking politics, uh, becomes more emphatic. Sorry, uh, Jennifer, I don't know what you, how you would, you would want to comment I agree that. completely with what you're saying. And the only thing I would add is that, especially in Chile, but especially in the Chile Journal, she's really invested in economics as well. Mm. She's clearly very cognizant of the fact that the global circulation of goods is driving British presence in South America. And so she actually includes appendices with trade figures. And that's another area, of course, that women were not meant to have any interest in or knowledge of. And actually, just excuse me to add to that, yeah. And again, one of the things recent scholarship has really started to unpack is the extent to which, you know, in some extent, it's our modern occlusion that we forget so many women were interested in this. And we as modern readers mm -hmm. almost, we, we've, we've believed all the conservative reviewers who said they shouldn't be. But actually, they were liberal reviewers at the Times who were actually perfectly up with women being interested in these things. So there was a debate at the time. But I suppose it's, it's the conservative reviewers we have mostly remembered. Uh, and then we forget that women were beginning to uh, pick up um, you know, political economy as a as a topic they wanted to, to follow, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yes, no, I think it's fascinating because one of my favorite parts in the journal is actually when she, um, they're in Pernambuco and Olinda is sieged. And she, um, they call her because apparently the, um, the, the, the militia, which was a small army, an independence army, they um, they they take the British uh, their 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 sheets and they refuse to give them to return them to to the doors, and they uh, and they ask Maria Graham to go there to get the sheets back. But what they actually want to do in my reading, I have a very specific reading of that, is that they're kind of using her to get because she was very close. She was she was close to that political elite in Pernambuco. So she was going to their houses for dinner and um, I forgot the name of the of the of the general who was in charge of the Rego is, is that Luis de Rego? Yes, Luis de Rego. And it's so fascinating because the the whole episode she starts narrating it as if it were about the sheets. So they call me and I went there with uh, with Lini and with her cousin and we're there for the sheets. And all of a sudden she says, but the junta, want, the junta wants to speak with me. 
and I have no idea why. And you know, it's clearly that she knows why they want yeah. to, mm -hmm. to speak with her. And her narration of it is something of a hero. And at some point, um, she's she's uh, the way she uh, she describes the scene is as if she were alone with that junta. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. However, later on, she tells us that Glini had been there all along. So I, I love these narrative techniques because although most of the time she does have, uh, she does play with this modesty rhetoric, rhetoric. Sometimes she, it's not even that. She has this very literary narrative of events that keeps the reader very interested in the story. Mm. And you forget completely that this was about the sheets and this is, this is actually about much more than that. And she's able to unpack that in her narrative in a way which I, I find, you know, um, and, and I'm sorry I'm making a huge comment. It's just because I'm a, I'm a nice. newbie and a No, it's wonderful. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and, but I think it's, um, I think the way she narrates is something, uh, I think it's, I mean, of course, all travel writers, including Humboldt uh, um, and the major Darwin and so on, uh, also, they have a way of narrating and they have, uh, um, but at the same time, I think, the way she creates narratives uh, has also to do with the fact that she needs to somehow uh, approximate her rhetoric, rhetoric to what was already um, to what was already accepted for women writers to do. So after making this huge comment, I would like you, um, can you uh, perhaps talk a little bit about how I think she uses some um, narrative strategies that um, are very close to literature produced by women in the 18th century. Um, do you think this is, a, um, is this something that, um, can you have ever thought about this? And is this something that has ever come across in your own research? Kenfer, what, what do you want to start Because you, you were touching on some of those themes, weren't you, with the conversion mm -hmm. narrative, Gothic narrative? So yes. Sure, yes, absolutely. So as I mentioned briefly, the Chile Journal does have an absolutely clear plot, you know, that you can trace out with a kind of a crisis and then a rising action and a conflict. Graham gets very involved in Lord Cochrane's conflicts with General San Martin and others. Um, and she's really smart in how she chooses the narrative conventions that she will follow and that will work to pull her readers into the text because the Gothic was a late 18th and early 19th century genre that essentially made it possible for women to have adventures because here's a gothic heroine at the beginning of the novel invariably she loses all of her parents somehow through no fault of her own ever she's cast out usually in a foreign country and she has to find a way to make her own way in the world although the, the heroine is always crafted as someone who would have preferred to stay in a very traditional woman's role so in other words, she's not an intrepid, unfeminine girl trying to find adventure. Adventure is thrust on her. Similarly, Mar Maria Graham starts her Chile journal at the moment when she lands in the harbor of Valparaiso and she has no husband and everyone flocks around trying to figure out what to do with this unprotected woman. And from there, she gradually introduces her own persona. So, for example, rather than live with some of the other naval captains, she rents her own house. She buys herself a horse and she starts riding around the country on her own, accompanied usually by one of the midshipmen. So she very carefully chooses her genre. The Brazil Journal, as I mentioned, doesn't have quite as clear a narrative convention, but I love the scene you're bringing up, Julia, because I agree. It's this sort of comedy about the sheets. What could be more domestic and feminine than a woman going to look after the laundry? And yet all of a sudden, here she is in conversation with a revolutionary leader, or, um, so on. <laughs> 
you know, embroiled in this conflict between the patriots. Um, and yeah, I'll I'll stop there. Well, I'll just add one more thing, which was returning to the issue of political economy. Maria Graham, in fact, was a woman unprotected. She had to make her own way in the world. The way she was doing that was by publishing travel writing. So she had to have these books sell. And we still read Graham and Mary Kingsley and other women writers today when many of the men of their time we no longer have any interest in because if you have a chapter that involves this whole comedy of errors with the laundry versus a chapter which starts out, here are the major products and the trade potential of Pernambuco or whatever it might be. The one that includes a narrative and literary strategies is far more engaging to read. She introduces us to characters. They take on a life and a personality of their own. There's conflict, there's misunderstandings. And so those literary strategies also served her in good stead, just as far as selling her books. Yes. Yes, definitely. And I think this is actually, uh, uh, it's very interesting. Um, I think Carl mentioned this, how she how she matures from the first journal uh, until the, uh, um, through the following ones, because she's not as authorial in the, in the journal, in, in uh, the Indian journal. Um, and, and, and I find that I, um, the introduction of it, she, she places herself as a uh, an observer, um, a distanced observer, I mm. think it's her. Um, and a, a philosophical traveler is how she Yes, to, exactly. I think quite important, yeah. Actually, well, can I just come on a couple of points picking up what Jennifer's saying as well? Because I'm basically yes, just adding definitely. Jennifer's sort of fascinating discussion there. It's worth saying, I think, and this links a little bit to what you're, you're, you're talking about, Julia, now, this crafting of narratives, of course, the, the other dimension of it that's worth emphasizing is it's not just about putting literary devices in or literary sort of tropes and, and and sort of plots in it's also the craft of travel writing um is how to weave in all this hard factual information across multiple sort of topic areas into the personal narrative uh, and it's really interesting what i need to think about the india journal is we have quite a lot of her surviving journal that is her actual journal not her published mm -hmm. journal and if you put the two side by side it's really interesting because something that's you know seems a fairly ordinary journal entry in her private journal you know i arrived at bombay blah, 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 saw this when you see how she's transformed it into the opening of the actual journal you can see the amount of skill that has gone in to sort of blend her actual first impressions with a lot of fat useful factual stuff um, that she's obviously garnered over subsequent weeks and so it's this really sophisticated um exercise in presenting information in a way that as jennifer was saying reads very fluently it reads within a narrative um but she's crafting the different lines of information and jennifer's excellent addition with, with solidar which i've been waving at you a couple of times you do that a bit Jennifer, because of course you give us then the sort of more informal bits that she was possibly going to be the raw material for the second edition mm -hmm. and again you can see you can see the difference in tone i think um in various sometimes in those interpolations that jennifer and solidar put in She's much more forthright when she talks about politics. She's just, here's some political stuff. I'm not dressing it up. This is how I write it. Uh, so that that's worth bearing in mind. Uh, and I think just to add to my point about how she builds and your point there, Julie, about how she builds, of course, the other thing we need to remember is that we tend to, for understandable reasons that Jennifer's alluded to, we tend to foreground and read the narrative sections of of, of of graham's publications but if you go back to the actual books you know there's there are massive historical introductions at the start really substantial you know part of it and the whole package of the book not just the personal narrative which is what we all most readers read now that the appendices and the introduction are much more scholarly works than that ever happened in the first india journal i mean um so so that's changed as well and i think i think that introduction to the brazil you can see she is she's drawing on, but she's also challenging Southeast Brazil. You know, she, she is asserting her own sort of position as a sort of popular historian. Um, and with, with Chile particularly, I think, because there, there, there had been very little recent history of Chile. And I found later anthologists in the, I think, late 1820s, early 1830s are saying, right, well, we have had no history of Chile for years. We will use Graham's account as a, as a history. So I think I think she, that, that there's a sort of scholarliness there that is in the, 
sort of paratextual information, if you like, that's worth emphasizing. Yes. Yes, definitely. And in, in, in her journals also use this as a historical document for uh, to talk about Brazilian independence. And I've seen this in several historical books. It's just that, you know, um, I was talking to Jennifer the first time I came across this narrative was through an article, a newspaper article in uh, El País, the Brazilian El País. Um, but then later, when I went back to certain history books about the independence, I realized that I had seen Graham's names named several times and I hadn't noticed because they were they were used as historical documents and um, I, and I think it's so uh, um, what you're saying Carl is um, is really relevant here because we're all talking about um, Graham as an editor of her own work mm. and uh, and this becomes so important because you can see, how uh, how she was so careful, and I haven't been able to read her correspondence between uh, with John Murray, but I can imagine how careful and thoughtful they were when they were editing these two South American journals, and um, and also so I would uh, perhaps you both could talk a little bit about uh, Graham as an editor, not only of her own diary, but also. Um, uh, I think I read your article, Carl, about how she edited uh, Bloxon's uh, travel well, voyage, of the voyage of the Voyage of the Blonde. Yes. Yes. In yes. Yeah. Which I think is fascinating, and all, and I think this goes to the life of Don Pedro as well, because um, in my view, she 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 just I don't know. Correct me if I'm wrong, but she just said I'm not going to publish this. I think she just left it aside. Do you think she had an? There are so many questions I'm asking. I know, but um. <laughs> Jennifer, do you want to talk about the Don Pedro, and then I'll, I'll say a bit about the blonde? Actually, I was going to suggest you start by talking about Graham as an editor because you know okay. much more about that than I do. Um, so let me organise my thoughts. Yeah, well, just to explain to to listeners, so. Um, uh, another sort of career development that I think is a sign of the way in which she's taken as quite a serious sort of intellectual figure by by John, her, her close friend, the publisher John Murray, is that in, I, I might get the date slightly wrong, basically the early 20, 1820s, there's a British naval expedition to what we now call Hawaii, which carries back uh, the bodies of two Hawaiian dignitaries who'd, who'd come to Britain and, and, and died in Britain, and it takes them back. Um, and there, it wasn't seen as a very, you know, a major exploratory voyage, like something that Darwin might be on or to the Arctic or something. But it was seen as something that ought to have a um, a formal sort of naval record account published by Murray, who was the, the, the publisher to the board of Longitude and the Admiralty. So he published a lot of these formal naval exploration accounts. And um, basically the um, chaplain on the ship was understood that he was going to write this up. But what he handed in was was rubbish, apparently, and they couldn't work with it. So they got Graham in to edit it down to something that was publishable. Uh, and she took blocks and there's two blocks and on this thing. If I remember, there's, the, there's the chaplain and there's the I'm going to make it my own thing. Away. I'm sorry, basically, I'll, I'll skip the names. I get the names confused. But basically, she ends up taking the chaplain's account, a couple of other accounts that she's provided, and then getting reports from a lot of people about what happened on the voyage and then sort of collating them into a sort of synthesized account that starts off with the chaplains, but boils it down and weaves in these other accounts. Uh, and again, we enough of it, 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 enough of bits of it survive in the various forms that you can see the sort of job she's done. And the sort of job she's done is very much, again, not what you might think a literary woman writer might do. It's about boiling it down to hard information. Whereas the chaplain has all these sort of Latinate flights of fancy, like, you know, um, uh, and then we we slipped into the arms of Morpheus and Graham says they fell asleep <laughs> you know uh, the winged tribe lulled us in the evening uh, there was plentiful bird song yes I'm, I'm slightly making up what you can see of what survives is her emphasis is to boil it down to hard information and to do the transitions i mean she got into trouble eventually with this as well because actually what happens of course if you start weaving multiple accounts together it does get harder to pin down who exactly is saying what and she does get a bit tangled up in places and then when there was a fuss about the book, because it was rude about American missionaries, this information that she had edited it came out. And then she got roundly attacked by lots of reviewers because it was a sort of 
unspoken secret of a lot of travel accounts that you they weren't supposed to be edited they were supposed to present themselves as here are my simple diaries written on the spot but in fact lots of them were you know someone like mungo park the explorer in africa you know, his work was edited down it was a sort of open secret slightly that lots of these travel accounts were more edited than they appeared um so yes yeah, so, so you, you can see graham doing this really quite complex editing work really trying to really conscientiously trying to draw together as much information as she can to make it as factually useful as she can uh, my favorite detail from that is that, um she she seems to have acquired from one crew member a stuffed marine iguana and she carried this four foot stuffed marine iguana to the british museum to compare it to the british museum's stuffed marine iguana um and from that she deduced she must be looking at the female of the species and as far as it sounds silly but as far as I see, she's the first person to like correctly identify or, or another species so she correctly i think identifies a different species of marina guada uh from doing this um but again this all got sort of um lost to history because you know she was she after the controversy she was seen as a sort of someone who'd done a hatchet job on supposedly this wonderful original manuscript but the original manuscript was terrible and graham did the best she could to pull it together <laughs> Sorry, over to you, Jennifer, sorry. Uh, if it's okay, I'll take this in a slightly different direction because Julia, you mentioned the unpublished life of Don Pedro and I find that so fascinating. And I think one reason she never published it is because it dealt with such sensitive material, right? But another reason I think is that although, as Carl says, she was a highly skilled editor and could easily take incoherent strands of somebody else's narrative and make them into something coherent. The life of Don Pedro is really two different narratives. One is what the title implies, an historical account of this really fascinating political experiment in which a son declares independence from his father, really, right? And then his daughter, um, Maria da Gloria, the princess that Graham very briefly was the governess to, then goes on to become the queen of Portugal in turn, right? So they're sort of drawing back together the strands of this apparent rupture. But the other part of the life of Dom Pedro is the account of Graham herself going into the palace and what I, my reading at least of that is that although we've said as she develops as a writer, Graham becomes increasingly able to stand outside of her British imperial perspective, with her injection into the palace, that all, that distance fell apart. So she really crafts that narrative, which we were saying just before this event began, is in the Brazilian National Library, and there's a copy at Oxford, and those are the only two copies in the world as far as I know, and it's fascinating, very well worth someone bringing out into a new edition at some point. In that narrative, she tells the story of her entering the palace, being horrified by the way this child is being raised because they were really shocking things. So for example, this little princess was fed chicken stewed with garlic and onions. And Graham just couldn't get over the garlic and onions, which clearly <laughs> no civilized person should ever eat, and certainly not a child who should be raised on bread and milk, right? <laughs> there was a dressing ceremony every day in which the little princess was put on a table and she was dressed. And the idea of a child being partly disrobed in public for someone who didn't regard herself as an English woman, but did have some of those sensibilities was really profoundly shocking. So she says things in the journal, I'll just read a couple of short quotations. She says, what a delightful thing to rescue that fine child from the hands of such creatures as surrounded her. All right, so this is a foreigner going into a palace given charge over the Imperial princess. You can imagine that the creatures surrounding her were not thrilled to be told what a shocking job they were doing. She also says, I confess I was carried away by the notion of bringing up a person upon whose education and personal qualities, the happiness of a whole empire was to depend. I fancied what Brazil might be under a better government than any country but my own had ever enjoyed. So Graham really seems to see herself as saving this entire nation by essentially turning the little princess into an English child. 
And so at least in my view, the courtiers were absolutely in the right to eject her from the palace as quickly as they possibly could. But this narrative shows that however much Graham could edit others, in terms of her own national identity and her perspective, she was not always able to ex escape that perspective. And uh, fascinating, really, because uh, I, I, I wasn't able to get back to the Don Pedro narrative to read it for this, because I have stuff going on, so, so it's, my memory's hazing, so it's really interesting to be reminded of that. So, we'll say that. One thing that perhaps ought to be said, which links to that, Jennifer, um, as I'm sure Jennifer possibly knows, is, um, we'll, we'll know, is that Graham herself was quite a sort of, um, what's the right word for this? Well, it, it, in English, we have a phrase, I don't know if it in Brazilian, but someone being a Marmite personality, because Marmite is a sort of strange mm. food stuff we have, which people either love or they hate. And and I think Graham was a sort of Marmite. So we sometimes say people have a Marmite, you, know, that, that you love them or they hate them. Graham was a very forthright persona. She had quite a distinctive conversational style. She clearly liked to sort of quiz people and to sort of parade her intellect a bit. And, and you could see that perhaps coming out of her time in the salons in Edinburgh and then when she's moving in a certain set of wig circles when she's newly famous in in london around holland house they, they were famous for their quizzing style these sort of the impression that men or women and more shockingly women would sort of browbeat you with do you think that and we have a number of wonderful things about how she would dominate conversations or be the presence of conversations um a lovely quotation about how she shocked a room when she's had this sound on the 1830s by saying as for me i'd be rather called a bitch than a female um, and these sort of quite provocative things so i think she has this big personality uh, and and manner that probably rubbed them up the, the wrong way as well. And then the other thing, I, I, I don't think you might not know this, Jennifer. But, you know, I mean, I, I can show it to you in a second. There's, there was certainly hostility to her in the court from the moment she arrived, mm -hmm. because we have at least I'll, I'll show you one dignitary saying, "Oh, this woman has just arrived, and she's liberal and forward-thinking, and clearly not the right person to be in charge of the." Yeah. Um, of they the called princess. her the second foreigner. Oh, did I did that. Right. Okay, yeah. I was thinking of this. Let me see if I can if I find it for you. Um, this little letter that's in the archive in, um, is that now showing for you? Is the screen cut, is, is, is the slide showing? Ah, yeah. Yes. So, so if we go through uh, that, I got this. Yes, from, I don't, so I don't really know enough about it. It's, it's someone in your audience or yourself, Julia or, or Jennifer, you might know who Felipe Leopoldo Wenzel Banya de Marisha is, but he, he, it's in French, but he's clearly, um, uh, you know, this is a woman, a lot of spirit, but the religion and the political principles very liberal render, render her, it seems to me, someone least suitable for this important task. And she, he, he said he looks forward to seeing her on a, you know, thrown out before very long. Um, so, so there clearly was this uh, hostility there. So lots of things I think are going on. There's it's a little sort of cauldron of, of clashes of personalities and political viewpoints happening when she yes. arrives at the court. And also because I've only read, I really want to read the English uh, version of it because I've only read it in Portuguese. So this is a translation from 1981, I think, uh, when the when the manuscript was acquired. Um, but I, I I read it as you know, um, there's a very strong defense of Maria Leopoldina because there's also a tone of denouncement of what uh, Leopoldina lived inside the palace, right? Um, the constant abuse and, and threats. And, um, and it's so, um, even I, I, at some point I, I had, when I was reading it, I had the feeling that it was much more about Leopoldina than, than Don Pedro. Because um, it says, and, and consider, I was wondering if, uh, considering that the manuscript was written right after uh, Don Pedro passed away, if this was some kind of uh, a vengeance or something, because clearly, of course, she was kicked out of the palace. But apart from that, um, she was really good friends with Lopo Gina, right? And, um, and, and she was extremely angry that he got in the way with, with her friendship. I think that's fascinating. I'm really, really compelled by that friendship. And returning to the point that I made earlier about the way Graham's time in Chile is recast as this romance with Cochrane. At one point, there was a website that listed, you know, 
lesbian relationships in history and Maria Leopoldina and Maria Graham were listed. And I think that's fascinating because there's this impossibility of imagining a very close female friendship that wouldn't have some kind of sexual component to it. Mm -hmm. And again, I think, you know, knowing both personalities, that's absolute rubbish. But a really strong friendship, as you say. Maria Leopoldina was the one who invited Graham to come into the palace. So absolutely, even before she arrived, there were courtiers, Maria Graham calls them in the, the manuscript, cabals, who were dead set against her, you know, no matter what she had been like, even if she hadn't had this imperial perspective. And the phrase, the second stranger, I think is so interesting in characterizing how Maria Leopoldina, that first stranger, must have been regarded. And so these two women were both highly educated, very intellectual, really involved in scientific circles, returning to what Carl said earlier about Graham's scientific work. Their first bond, I believe, was that Maria Leopoldina collected shells and didn't, she wasn't just a shell collector, she categorized them. Um, and, you know, was engaged in trying to identify new unidentified forms of shell and so on. And so when Graham returned to England after agreeing to take this position as governess, she did so really to gather scientific materials to educate these little imperial children who were all girls. And she had Maria, Leopold, uh, Maria da Gloria, the little princess, out in the garden, mucking about with dirt and making collections. This didn't go over well. <laughs> so there's this whole sort of discourse of the educated scientific woman that was the bond between the two of them and also a cause of huge suspicion. And they, they corresponded for the rest of Maria Leopoldina's sadly very short life. Yes. No, and it's it's interesting because um, they they had they have very they had very similar interests, but also the fact what you just said is it in English is it the second stranger? Yes, that's how they translate I... it as the segunda estrangeira, as seg mm. a second foreigner. This is mm. an interesting translation, actually. <laughs> Something to look into. Absolutely. Um, yes. Um, but also uh, the, th the fact that uh, Leopoldina, her own education had been uh, very, uh, you know, uh, she was educated in all sciences and so on as a Habsburg. And, um, and, and it, it really hurt Leopoldina not being able to give the, uh, her daughters the education that she had when she was in Austria because the Portuguese court did not have the same tradition in educating women and men as well, because Dom Pedro was not the most, uh, most well-educated or book-read uh, um, uh, prince, right? Um, and this was also something that, that's why they had, they had a very strong, apart from a very strong friendship, they had a very strong intellectual bond. And um, and I think it was it was um, for for Graham to see her friend being uh, prevented to practice her intellectual life was something that um, that really hurt her because I have the feeling when I read that manuscript that there is a lot of hatred to, towards uh, Don Pedro not only mm -hmm. because of course he threw her out but also because he kept her friend from pursuing something that she really enjoyed doing, right? Oh, yes, definitely. Sorry, I was, yeah, yeah. And no, Jennifer it's... spoke, spoke ex ex excellently. I'm just a, taking a slightly different direction, building on that. I mean, yeah, I, I, these networks of women engaged in science is really something mm -hmm. that's really fascinating sort of development of the last 15 years, particularly. I mean, people, obviously, we, people, have, scholars have worked on it before then, but. I think there's been a really explosion over the last decade on how, how much we now realise women were involved in science in this early 19th century period, because it was a time, um, the term some scholars use is a time of sort of polite science, when it's actually fashionable to do science, and you didn't have the big sort of institutional divides between a sort of science and a research scientist in a research lab at a university and someone at home, 
every all those groups actually were much more mixed up. So women like Leo Hodina and, and Graham could really mix with real scientists and Definitely. do their own science. And, and it's been really interesting to swatch over the stuff, like how much we just rediscovered this whole world of yeah. Mary Somerville, uh, Maria Graham and so on. Yes. And it's important to say that uh, when Leopoldina came to Brazil, uh, the, the expedition, the Austrian expedition, mm. na natural sciences came with her. So uh, Speaks mm. and Matthews and so on, um, they, they, they came with her. It was, uh, it was part of the deal, let's say. <laughs> Actually, uh, just, just to build that as well, and this goes back to um, a comment Jennifer made in her talk. Um, Jennifer you mentioned the sort of the proto-feminism notion and you know and you quite rightly said that sort of that there are these moments when where Graham is quite rude about other women but it is also the case I think you can I mean you can see her really I think as proto-feminist because I think she is aware when she wants to as, as I know you've written about uh, all, in many occasions of bringing in notable female figures when she can mm -hmm. you know whether it's the it's the, the the Brazilian woman who fights as a soldier it's some of the mm -hmm, sort of figures yes, in Chile uh, and, and and I think you can see this it, it, it's a deliberate thing I am going to put noteworthy women doing things mm -hmm. you know things that men do and I am myself mm -hmm. going to be that figure as well so there is that that's proto-feminism woven into it I think yeah and it's interesting because those are the women that she chooses to uh, to let's say to bring out in her narrative, while mm -hmm. the others, British or Portuguese, the ones who are non-educated or have no intellectual interest, are so uninteresting for her that she constantly mocks them. You know, as the British one who would need Miss Austen's pen to make mm -hmm. them interesting or something of this sort. But it, it, it is a sort of sorry. It is a sort of proto-feminism that is a bit like Austen's, or it's a bit yes. Like Yes. Right. Wollstonecroft is scathing about women who've bought or bought into sensibility completely, sort of thing, and these things. So I think it, it you know, it's not necessarily the most sympathetic sisterhood we might imagine later. No. But I think in its own terms, it is a it is a, a, a branch of proto feminism. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I completely agree. And even examples like the image I showed of the um, woman soldier soldier. So Graham creates a whole little narrative about meeting Dona Maria de Jesus, I think her name mm -hmm. is, and talking about her courage and how she's distinguished herself in the battle yes. of Ricamave. And so just kind of casually bringing in, look what women can do. She was not only fighting, but braver than most of the men in this situation. She does that very strategically, I think. Yes. Uh, I just also wanted to add that, um, Carl, you're always very modest, but speaking of the discovery of women's scientific activity that we've made over the last 10 years and how we're increasingly aware of all of the polite science that women were fully able to engage in. You've been really instrumental in bringing critical attention to that. So I'd just like to thank you. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you much. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's probably part of a bigger wave, of course, but yeah, one likes to think one owns bits are part of that one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank you. Oh, I'm so sorry, but we have to, we have to end it. And this talk was amazing. It's a huge pleasure to be able to, talk to you both and to hear you speaking. Thank you so much for accepting uh, my invitation and uh, the library's invitations. It was lovely. And I feel really lucky because I've read your articles in the past few years. So it just feels um, really, really um, rewarding <laughs> to talk to you both. Um, thank you so much for being here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Only sadness is maybe one day we can do this in Rio or Sao Paulo. That would be lovely. Yes, <laughs> that, that would be. Would be yes, that would be great. Yeah. Yes, that day will come. We're, we're really looking forward to it. This nightmare ending. Thank you yes. so much. Thank you. So thank I'm you so going... much for the invitation yes. and for celebrating Maria Graham as well. Thank you. And I'm just going to switch to Portuguese very quickly to thank our viewers. <laughs> É, muito obrigada àqueles que nos assistiram, muito obrigada é, também a, ao Rodrigo Garcia, que esteve aqui em todo, com todo o suporte técnico, e também ao João Cardoso, que foi muito gentil e também nos ajudou, deu todo o suporte de divulgação do evento, e, claro, a Biblioteca Brasiliana Mindelin por sediar esse, esse, essa, essas palestras e também nos ajudar a homenagear 
aos 200 anos da Graham no Brasil. Muito obrigada e muito obrigada por nos assistir. Obrigada, Rodrigo. Thank you so much, Carl. Thank you so much, Jennifer. I look forward to seeing you again. Obrigada. Tchau. Goodbye. Tchau.